Hello, welcome to Learning with the Cleveland Orchestra. My name is Rose Breckenridge and I'm lecturer for the Cleveland Orchestra Music Study Groups. Today we're going to be talking about Antonin Dvorak's Cello Concerto in B minor. Antonin Dvorak was the leader of the Czech National School following Smetana and his life is central to the context of this wonderful cello concerto. He was born in 1841 uh, and this was in a small village outside of Prague. The family struggled financially uh, but his father knew and saw very early that his son was quite gifted musically and he wanted to make certain that his son had opportunities to develop that skill and talent and so um, he actually made it possible for Dvorak to go to a neighboring village and get some education and then later as a teenager uh, uh, age 16 Dvorak went off to Prague uh, to study at the organ school there and began to seriously develop uh, towards his goal of becoming a professional musician. Um, he earned a job eventually playing viola in what would become the Czech National Orchestra, led by Smetna, who was, in a sense, his mentor, um, because Smetna was very devoted to Czech music, folk music, and folk songs, and he wrote an, uh, many uh, Czech operas using the Czech language. Uh, but Dvorak, uh, after a number of years in his 20s, still was not known. He was playing in the uh, orchestra uh, under Smetna during the day and studying and composing scores at night. Um, but he decided that uh, he would resign uh, his post uh, in the orchestra and uh, take on a job as an organist. That was in 1873. Um, he also got married that year and he wanted to more seriously uh, compose uh, to try to support his uh, young family. Um, well, his big break came in the middle of the 1870s when he uh, submitted a pile of scores uh, to the committee uh, from the Austro-Hungarian government, uh, hoping to win an award that would uh, in advance his career. And Johannes Brahms, this is a big break, was on that committee of judges and he immediately saw the great talent of this young composer and saw to it that Dvorak did indeed receive uh, several grants over the next two, uh, few years that would launch his career. And Brahms went further than that. He actually introduced Dvorak uh, and his music to Simrock Publishing Company. Uh, this was Brahms' own music publishing company and they actually publish uh, Dvorak's Moravian duets, and those were so popular that they commissioned him to write the Slavonic dances. And so Brahm, uh, Brahms really launched uh, Dvorak's career, and he, now the young composer Dvorak, became very well known, first in Bohemia, then in Austria, Germany, eventually in England, and in the United States. Uh, in 1892, a wealthy philanthropist, Jeanette Thurber, was founding a new uh, a conservatory of music in New York City that would uh, accept any students if they had talent enough, even if they didn't have the money. And she actually uh, recruited Dvorak to be the head of that conservatory. Uh, the goal uh, that she had was a very um, Dvorak was very sympathetic to it given his own background and circumstances. So he came in 1892 to New York City to head up this conservatory, bringing some of his family and then bringing more of them over shortly. He was a big family man and was very uh, involved uh, not only with his immediate family but his extended family as we'll see in a moment. Uh, during his tenure uh, in New York, he actually wrote probably his greatest and most popular symphony, number no. nine, from the New World. In this symphony, uh, he was uh, synthesizing the various influences in his career. He was uh, quite devoted to the Beethoven Brahms symphonic tradition. Brahms, of course, was one of his mentors. Uh, and yet he wanted to synthesize it with his love for Czech folk music and folk dance uh, that he was so committed to because of his humble uh, upbringing in um, the small villages outside of Prague and also the influence of Smetna. 
Um, his melodic gift was incredible. He was able to write many fresh and spontaneous uh, melodies, and he was also an excellent colorist, uh, clothing those melodies in a wonderful different shades of hue, if you will, from the orchestral palette. Um, and uh, he also was quite devoted to uh, folk music. Um, and in his tenure uh, as director here uh, at the New York um, Conservatory of Music, uh, he encouraged his students to seek inspiration from uh, folk music. His own music, as I've said, was influenced by uh, folk music using modal scales and folk rhythms. Um, and um, he was convinced that this music had a depth of feeling uh, because uh, so many common uh, peasant uh, people who developed folk music um, were often um, oppressed and uh, had great feelings of longing for a better life. Uh, but they also, in their wistful, melancholy songs, never let it overcome them. And they always rose above their circumstances and returned frequently to happy dance tunes and march tunes also. And he was able to incorporate that in that famous New World Symphony and influence his own students in the form of uh, American folk music. He was quite inspired by Negro spirituals uh, that uh, his student Henry Burley, an African-American uh, student, introduced him to. And we'll see these uh, different influences, the symphonic tradition of folk music also playing a, a strong role in the development of uh, his cello concerto. Uh, he was quite buoyed with the success of his uh, uh, New World Symphony, uh, which uh, he completed in the first part of his tenure here uh, in uh, the United States in New York City. And towards the end of his tenure, he decided that he would write a cello concerto. Um, this cello concerto in B minor that we're looking at today, he began at the end of 1894 and completed it at the beginning of 1895. Uh, before he left to go back to his beloved Bohemia, uh, where he could speak his own Czech language and take long walks in the meadows and woods and listen to the beautiful birds. Um, and so those uh, influences that I've been talking about came together uh, in this work. Um, many of the lyric melodies are quite wistful and melancholy and influenced by uh, his love of uh, folk music. But we also have some sprightly dances and marches. In terms of the symphonic aspect, um, uh, we have a combination in this work of a symphonic texture, uh, quite dramatic, employing the full large orchestra, but also many sections that are almost like cham chamber music. And um, he did this very consciously because uh, he did not want to cover the more mellow and darker sound of the cello. Um, cello concertos are difficult to write, and he had tried to write one as a young man, but never finished it because of this problem. Uh, we all know there's many violin concertos and many piano concertos because violin tone is high and brilliant and can stand out against uh, orchestra in the background. And by the way, in the 19th century, the orchestra had become quite large, and so this was an increasingly challenging problem. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, his use of, of uh, pairing the cello in these chamber sections when the scoring is reduced um, to be a very light, if you will, um, pairing the cello, the solo cello, uh, with wonderful tone qualities of uh, woodwinds. Yet the uh, concerto does not lack symphonic qualities. Uh, it is definitely in the Beethoven Brahms tradition with some dramatic sections employing full orchestra. And also in the very first mo movement, uh, we begin with an orchestral exposition. Um, and this, uh, shall we say, custom or tradition uh, dated back um, to Mozart, Beethoven, and Brahms carried it forward, where uh, the orchestra would do the honors of introducing the melodic material first, and we would then uh, hear from the um, 
uh, soloists only later on into the composition. And so let's uh, look at that first movement, the Allegro. Um, it really uh, comes uh, gradually to the fore, starting out with a sort of quiet, we think, uh, rhythmic figure in B minor that's introduced first by the clarinet, but it soon grows in a crescendo uh, until it's full-throated in the complete orchestra. strings and the crescendo starts as it grows the horns come underneath figure dum da da dum uh, that uh, he will treat differently in the first movement and also bring back uh, as we'll see at the end of the finale but let's turn now to the second theme which is in qu uh, quite a contrast it's uh, scored for solo horn at first um, and uh, it moves over to a major key and it's very long to breathe and lyric. Um, uh, the cello will eventually also get to sing it. Uh, let's hear it here, here in the horn. as we'll see, loves the clarinet. He passes this melody over to that instrument. Now this serene, quiet mood will gradually uh, pass uh, and uh, we'll finally get to hear our soloist. It's almost four minutes into the movement before the soloist shows up. Uh, but he takes over that B minor opening theme with great vigor. eventually we'll get to the more serene lyric second idea uh, which the cello also gets to sing and here it is um, it, first he sings it all by himself but as we'll see uh, Dvorak also pairs him with some beautiful woodwinds first here it comes One instance in this movement where he pairs the cello almost magically uh, with some woodwinds occurs in the, uh, the uh, middle of it. Um, where we call it the development, the rising action of the play, if you will. And the cello takes that opening theme, dum, da-da-dum, 
and it slows it down and lifts it up to a very remote key of A flat um, and the theme becomes almost ethereal uh, and eventually uh, Dvorak also pairs it uh, in the cello with the flute. I just love this uh, particular section. It's quite uh, wonderful. So let's hear it right now. he'll round it off by going back to a more full-throated statement of that rhythmic figure uh, for this movement. Now the second movement is very very special uh, because what happened uh, was um, Dvorak and his wife Anna uh, got word while he was composing this concerto in New York that Anna's sister Josefina had fallen very seriously ill and uh, the two couples, uh, Anna and Antonine, were very close with uh, Josefina and her husband. And so what Dvorak did is he decided to uh, make this concerto a bit of homage to Josefina. But there's a backstory too, uh, because as a young man before he was married, uh, he took on piano students in order to help uh, pay the bills and put food on the table. And Josefina was one of his students. And uh, Antonine fell very deeply in love with her. The only problem was she did not reciprocate uh, that affection and rejected him and went on to marry someone else. Antonine eventually got over being rejected and then fell in love with her sister, Anna. And then the two couples became very close friends. So in this movement, in the middle of it, he actually uh, quotes a, a melody of a song that he wrote, setting a poem in Czech uh, to music with piano accompaniment, a leader, uh, we call it. Um, and uh, it was Josefina's favorite song and uh, he was uh, memorializing and giving her homage by that. The second movement uh, first starts though, not with jo uh, Josefina's song, but with another beautiful melody in G major. Here it is again in the clarinet. He loves the clarinet. Of course, the cello gets to sing that melody also. This is a beautiful, serene melody, as I mentioned, in a major key. In the middle of the movement, though, he plunges us into G minor. And then he quotes from this song that he had, a uh, poem that he had said as leader, let me wander alone with my dreams. And as I said, this was uh, Josefina's favorite of all his leader uh, that he had composed and she frequently asked him uh, to play it for her. So we've been floating along in this serene, uh, lovely melody in uh, G major, and then all of a sudden, plunged into minor, and here is G 
but not right away. Uh, we lose this kind of wistful, uh, reverie kind of music uh, in the middle movement as we enter the finale, which moves us back to B minor, allegro, uh, starting out dramatically with a march from afar at first. First in the horns. Woodwinds, violins, and now the orchestra. And now the cello will announce what will become a kind of rondo like refrain in this movement. Jack's going to turn it into a dance. Here it comes. Now this uh, march-like melody that turns into a dance becomes very important throughout the movement, as I said, recurring almost like a rondo refrain. Uh, one of the first contrasting melodies that we meet uh, is a beautiful, uh, wistful tune that um, shows up, interestingly enough, in the clarinet with sighs. Um, tune, uh, what he does in the middle of the movement when it comes back, he slows it down um, and uh, it becomes quite different. Here it is in the slowed down version, soft, slow, and solemn, uh, presented first by the cello. movement we're back and forth between lyric wistful melancholy uh, melancholy and also high drama full orchestra uh, so uh, I want to go now ahead to the uh, a section that, that he inserted uh, at the uh, end of the movement uh, when he got back to Bohemia it completed the concerto uh, but uh, as soon as they got back uh, very shortly after, Josefina died. And um, uh, what he decided to do is insert this kind of uh, andante coda. It's quite beautiful, really, uh, where he recalls uh, Josefina's song from the uh, slow movement and also um, the slower version of the opening to the first movement. It um, starts out with the cello, 
kind of singing here. Well, first here, here comes the cello. Soon we'll intertwine with a solo violin. singing Josefina's song. And now, reminiscence of the opening of the first movement and its slow, nostalgic version. It's almost with great effort that he has to pull himself out of this to conclude with a maestoso major tutti finish. Here it comes. I hope you get a chance to listen to the whole thing. My name is Rose Breckenridge.